Annabelle, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jason. It's great to be here. I am so excited for this interview because I love, love, love walking. It is one of my favorite things to do. It is one of my favorite things to do when I'm not even in New York. I'm a New Yorker. I love walking here, but whenever I'm traveling, whether it's a new city or a beautiful landscape, I just love to get out there and walk. And so when I saw your title, 52 ways to walk, the surprising science of walking for wellness and joy one week at a time, I was like, I must have this. And so I, I didn't realize there were other people like me. So, so let's start. What inspired you to write this great book? Well, I think there are, I think there are quite a lot of us out there, <laughs> but I think that there are probably a lot of people in my situation, which was, you know, going back a few years, every time I wanted to go for a walk at the time I had a, a large black much adored Labrador who needed quite a lot of walking. And whenever I wanted to go for a walk, which obviously with a dog was you know, twice or three times a day, uh, I kept coming up across, the, coming against this barrage of excuses, mainly from my family, but also from all my fair weather friends who would say things like, oh, it's too cold, or oh, it's too wet, or oh, it's too muddy, or oh, that route you've chosen is too steep, or it's too far. You know, there was always an excuse. And sometimes it was things like, oh, no, I can't. I've just eaten a huge meal. Or, oh, I can't. I'm really hungry. I've got to stay home and eat. You know, just so many excuses. And I just started scribbling them all down. I mean, my family were particularly bad. They would quite often, my kids would just say, oh, but walking's boring. Oh, so boring. And I thought, yeah, this is just not right. So I just started scribbling down all uh, many excuses. And at the time, I was writing a, a quite a different book about walking, about women walking, uh, you know, have women had walked in the past and been overlooked. And I was reading about, you know, George O'Keefe walking out in the middle of the night on the Texan Plains. And I was reading about how much she loved windy walks. And I had a, I have a friend in London who refuses to walk on windy days. So, so all of this was going around in my brain. And I thought, in the end, I thought, right, I'm going to write a book about all of the reasons that people give me for not walking. And I'm going to turn those reasons on their head. So uh, I'd been looking into the science and bizarrely, I had found pretty much for every excuse they gave me, I found a reason for going out for a walk. So, you know, wind is good. Rain is good. All of these things slightly intimidated by are actually, we're, we're designed to walk in them. Yeah, you know, we're built to walk whatever the weather, whatever the time of day or night and in whatever physiological condition we might find ourselves, you know, whether we can't walk very well or whether we are hungry or, or full or whatever. So I started digging into the science and the amazing thing about the world we live in is that, you know, we have incredible medical schools and laboratories and universities all over the world doing these really very obscure studies that weren't getting very much airtime, which I suspect is because, you know, people think, oh, walking, yeah, it's a bit boring. I know how to do that. So they didn't get as much airtime as I thought they, well, some of them didn't get any airtime. So I started putting them all together and Eventually, I seem to have. Eventually, I seem to have a book. <laughs> and of course, I, as I was researching, I was putting them all into practice, and I was you know, going out and talking to walking coaches and botanists and ornithologists. And I found a woman who just does smell walks. And all of these people would take me out, and they would say, you know, "This is how you walk with your nose," or "This is how you walk with your ears." Um, and these were things. Oh, this is how you walk when it's dark. This is how you walk silently. And these were all things that I hadn't really done myself but uh, it sort of really changed it, it certainly changed how I walked but I think it actually completely changed my life because like everyone else I was doing the same old walk same old friend same old park same old direction <laughs> which I, again I think in the pandemic a lot of people got into a little bit of a walking rut and I'm now completely out of my walking rut because every walk I do is is, is still a revelation so a lot to unpack there but l let's start with walking and and you mentioned being in a rut and when i read the book by one of my ta many takes was wow i think more people are doing more wrong when it comes to walking so i'm curious like what, what are some of the most common mistakes you found when you started doing your research where you said wow i i guess i'm doing this wrong and we're all doing that wrong and we should be thinking about walking in a whole different way like what, what sticks mm. out to you well, the first thing I started with was very basic, really, was our gait, you know, how we walk. Because if you can uh, uh, make a few little tweaks to how you walk, I discovered that you can then actually walk further, faster if you want to. It's just more pleasurable. And the 
what I discovered was that I, like many, many others, you know, we get up from our desk and then we just sort of plod off. And we've still all hunched because we spent all day over our laptop. So our shoulders are rounded. Our head is thrust forward from, you know, peering into the screen. Our stomach is all saggy because we're sitting in, you know, like this. And we, we weren't really designed for the life that we're currently living. Our bodies are extraordinary walking instruments. And every one of the bones and the muscles, all our limbs, they're all designed to walk, you know, not to cycle, not to sit in a chair, not just, you know, just to move uh, at that sort of pace, whether it's fast or slow. So the first thing I had to do was sort of unpack my posture and my alignment. So that was really quite basic and it was very easy. And literally now when I get up from my desk, I will spend about five to 10 seconds on my doorstep before I start walking. And I will just, you know, you know get my head back. So, so my spine is aligned and just lift up from the ribs so that I'm not, you know, slouching. And then I roll through my feet and then I use my arms. And again, I, in the past, I tend to just, you know, I, I was holding onto my dog or my hands were in my pockets. But now I realize that the arms are really, they, our arms are designed well for many things, but they're also designed to propel us along. So they are now a much more integral part of my walking. So that was the the sort of first thing. To summarize, stand up straight, use your arms. Is it that simple in terms of? Well, just, you need to align, make sure that you, we all just need to push our heads back slightly so that your earlobe is sitting immediately above your collarbone, not in laptop position. (laughs) And I think a lot of us don't even realize, but if you spend eight hours a day on a laptop, when you get up, you're still in that position and we sort of just off we go. We haven't really unrolled, if you like. So yeah, just there's about four or five different maneuvers and it's, it's sort of automatic now, but at first I had to make a bit of an effort and also working on how I was pushing through with my feet because again, I was just sort of plodding off. We all think we know how to walk, don't we? Yeah, no, I thought it was so interesting. Can you spend a little time on this? Because I think more often I started to think when I'm reading this, I'm like, huh, you know, and I love walking. I, I'm pretty active. I'm more, I would consider myself advanced in terms of, you know, my, my fitness and wellness hacks. But I started to really take a look at what I was doing right and wrong with regards to walking. So if you could, let's talk about feet also. Like what, what should our feet feel like when we're walking? Well, your feet, you should really be sort of rolling down, rolling through your, rolling through the ball of your foot. So going down on your heel, but not too hard. And the problem with what most of us wear, cushioned trainers, is that we are not really walking as we were intended to walk. Because of course, we, we never, we, for, for millions of years, we didn't wear cushioned trainers with, with you know, toe curls and things. We were in very thin soled uh, shoes. So I did switch my, I did change my footwear actually to wearing quite different, more minimal foot. I did change to minimal footwear actually, uh, which I found much more comfortable. So you, so you're rolling through and you're also, you're using all five of your toes. And I never, I hadn't thought about this before, but you know, we have five toes, you know, they're there for a reason and they are there not only for our balance, but to help us push off more efficiently. So we're not all pushing off with our, you know, one side of our foot. So a lot of us tend to just walk with uh, the big toe side of our foot, if you like. So just slightly on the inside, but we should be using the whole foot. It's quite hard to explain that without showing you. It's one of those things you really want someone to look at your foot and to you know, help you roll through your toes with you, which I can't really do at the moment. But <laughs> I, think it makes, I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense. And you also mentioned that, and this is something we've talked about extensively on this podcast, I think nasal breathing should be nasal breathing as we walk too right yeah we should absolutely be breathing certainly always inhaling through the nose i mean it's not so important how you exhale but the inhale is really important not only because our nose has the most extraordinary filtration system i mean it's staggering it has this uh, little filter in there which is really intricate and manages to filter out all of the a lot of the pollution and the germs and the pathogens and the dirt and the dust, just the stuff that if you're walking in, in New York or London, there's a, there's a lot of it and you don't really want it crossing over into your, you know, up into your brain or into your blood. Whenever you breathe through your mouth, there is no filtration system. It just goes straight into your lungs. So that's the first thing. And the second thing about breathing in through your nose is that we have all these incredible cells in our nose that produce nitric oxide and nitric oxide 
as you may know, is this uh, incredibly important molecule that was only discovered 20 years ago, but it's now been linked to, you know, good lung health and immunity, and it helps just push blood and oxygen all the way around your body and up to your brain. So it's a very simple reason, but I'll give you a little tip. If you want to increase the amount of nitric oxide that your nasal cells make, you just need to hum, just hum as you're walking. So just a little hum. Mm -hmm. Can't believe I actually demonstrated that, but you know what I mean? You could probably do it more tunefully. And no one will hear it because it's at quite a low volume, but that is that, that creates these extra oscillations in your nasal cells. I mean, it's, it's just incredible, isn't it? It is. Uh, and in terms of what I loved about the book, all the surprising benefits, specifically with a lot of science behind them, as we think about longevity, you know, one, one I thought was very interesting was 12 minutes in terms of duration. And, and, and cause I think it's a question everyone has, well, how much do I need to walk? How off, how in terms of duration, how far, and you cite this fascinating study at mass general where they studied 411 middle-aged men and women measuring 588 metabolites circulating in their blood and the metabolites profile how well or not well their bodies are functioning or our cells are repairing ourselves and, and doctors use metabolites as biological markers to, to gauge our overall health among other things. And so punchline is researchers found that after just 12 minutes, 12 minutes of walking, these remarkably revealing biomarkers had changed for the better. I said, wow, just 12 minutes. Yeah. Now that's a 12 minute brisk walk. But the, everyone, but anyone so, can do that. Anyone, anyone can do can that. Do you know, a, a fast 12 minute walk. You know, and I think as we think about the, the criticisms of health and wellness, it's time and money and walking is free and 12 minutes, you can easily figure out how to make that work into your day, no matter how mm. busy you are, you can break it up. You can run up brisk. You can go up the stairs even better. One of the things you talk about is incline flat, you can run up the stairs, you go up the stairs quick. Which segues to my other question I thought was so interesting. You talk about landscapes and, you know, there's a ranking river, you know, if you think about landscapes, rivers, oceans, mountains, and you say in the book that Wallace Nichols in his book, Blue Mine, that rivers follow oceans as the second best quote unquote, perfect landscapes for brain restoration. So how do you think about landscapes? And I'm curious, like what, uh, yeah, it kind of makes sense to me why oceans would be number one, who doesn't love a great ocean, but how do you think about landscapes? I, well, actually I prefer a river to the ocean myself. And I think uh, rivers are a bit more, they're a bit more accessible because most people can get to a river or a canal or a lake or even a pot, you know, it's sort of a, a, a pond. I'm sure, I'm sure Central Park has some quite nice ponds, doesn't it? <laughs> In terms of landscape, again, this was a, a real surprise to me. So the ones that seem to have the most effect are water. And there are, again, evolutionary and uh, scientific reasons for that, which I had no idea about. But I think if you ask anyone, they instinctively would say, oh, I love to walk by the sea or I love, you know, so we know it, don't we? But now we sort of, now science tells us why, which, which is, I always find fascinating. Uh, and the other one, of course, is uh, woodland, forest, trees, greenery. So that also has been found to have, again, you know, quite remarkable effects on things like our blood pressure and our immunity. Uh, and these are because of the phytoncides, a particular, a particular sort of phytoncide called a terpene that are produced by trees as they protect themselves from, uh, you know, germs and bacteria. So the trees that are, well, all, all trees produce phytoncides in varying quantities, and they produce different types of phytoncides and different, different types of terpenes. And different types of terpenes have different types of effects on our body and brain. And this is really only just now being unpicked. So the, the Japanese have been studying it for about 20 years, but that is not, 20 years is not very long. We've been studying it over in the West for maybe five years and water has been studied for, I don't know, maybe two or three years. It's really, we're just at the sort of very early stages of yeah, un understanding why our body changes and why our hormones change and why our brain changes when we're in the presence of woodland or, or your pine tree, 
conifers and pine trees or, or water or the sea. So I think over the next decade, we'll see a lot more fascinating research uh, explaining, explaining this. But the really simple thing is that if you think of us as um, nomads, I'm going back millennia here, we were originally nomadic. And what we needed above all in order to survive was water. So, and of course, originally we were walking out of Africa, out of very hot countries. So water was crucially important. So that message has somehow been encoded in our genes so that now when we come to water, uh, something happens in our head that says, hey, you're, you know, you're safe now because if you've got water, you've got food because it's nearly always the plant life and, and animal life and you've got liquid. So, so when we're near water, our stress levels, our cortisol just sort of, it just evaporates because suddenly it's like, hey, I can survive. And I, I love that. It's just so simple, isn't it? It's just such a simple thing. Water, survival, happy. Well, what's interesting too, you know, the, the science around nature bathing is exciting and, and evolving rapidly. And, you know, you talk about the power of, you know, scent, the beautiful sense of nature which, you know, instinctually makes sense to all of us. But on the flip side, for someone listening who lives in the city, who maybe doesn't have immediate access to a river or an abundance of trees, you also, I love this, talk about the unpleasant smells of the city. And they have, it. I'm going to segue to senses, specifically the unpleasant stenches. There's benefit there. So let's talk about that. So one of the things that I did when I was researching was I found this woman, I'll just call her, I'll just call her a doctor of smells. <laughs> And she had been studying the smells of specific cities for well over a decade and, and sort of and collecting them and creating the essences of Tokyo. And she'd done New York, she'd done Berlin, she'd done Edinburgh, and then she made the smells of the city in little bottles and drew these incredible maps. And, and as I, I said to her, will you, will, you take me out? will you take me out for a smell walk? And she said, yeah, of course. So we went to this little English market town and I was, I was thinking, oh, nothing to smell there. <laughs> and the walk was fascinating because what she did was she showed me how to stop being so focused on vision. And of course, you know, we are, as homo sapiens, we are slightly, slightly obsessed with being able to see, aren't we? It's all about what comes in visually. But she was like, you've just got to stop thinking about what you can see and stop thinking about what you can hear. And I just want you to focus on your nose. And then we, we, we walked around this town and she made me put my nose into uh, everything from coffee shops to pizza restaurants to, to uh, dustbins. I had to do the whole thing. And then I had to try and articulate the smell, which we don't normally do. If we, if we don't like a smell, we just walk away, don't we? Or if we do like a smell, we just say, that was nice. But trying to put them into words take, took it to a, a new level of, I guess, thoughtfulness about what was happening in my nose and then we put it onto maps and drew it and turned it into a little piece of art that was the process that she goes through but for me that was a absolute eye-opener or I should say a nose opener really nose because opener. I just hadn't thought of walking like that but now I will walk and I will just open the door of a shop and you know take a take a long inhale and then just move on <laughs> I don't know what people think of that, but because it's just a way of being really immersed in the city. And the city is fantastic for smells, actually. You know, you'd be amazed if you just stopped and smelled. There, it's all there, the whole of humanity. Well, before we move on to, to another sense, you mentioned being immersed in the city and you had a chapter I thought was fascinating titled Walk Deep and Seek Out Fractals, which to me speaks to the city. So can you talk about that? Yeah, so uh, walk deep is a, a term coined by an American writer who one day walked out of his house and decided as he walked that he would just think long and hard about every single thing he passed. In fact, the city is brilliant for this because every time you look up, you see a piece of architecture and you can ask yourself, you know, why was it designed like that? You know, who put that there? What is the purpose of that? You pass um, post boxes, you pass, uh, you pass street lamps, you pass, uh, you know, pavements that are perhaps are slightly wonky. You know, there's so much history in there, which again, normally we just walk over. So it's just really about walking very, I would say sort of almost mindfully, but in a very yeah. immersive way and making yourself, it's not a fast walk. You can't do that. You can't do that as a power walk, but and very much using your eyes and looking up, we tend to just walk and just look at eye level 
But again, when once you look up, particularly in cities, and particularly somewhere like New York, you know, the half of New York is up. So you look up and you can see all sorts of extraordinary things. And in fact, in fact looking up is amazing wherever you are, because you have the whole of the sky above you, which again is something that we, we don't really we don't really enjoy as much as we should. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about panoramic vision and why it's critical? Yeah, so going back to the postural alignment, first thing I do when I get onto my doorstep, actually even before I've twiddled around with my shoulders and my neck and my arms, is I look out into the distance. And it's really important that we do this because we're spending so much time on screen when we're not on screens for work we're on our you know we're on our iphone we're scrolling or checking emails or we're you know, reading on a kindle so you know we're on our screens all the time and again our bodies just weren't designed for that at all our eyes were designed to be scanning the horizon whether that was for predators or enemies or you know sign of water so we're designed to be looking into the distance if you think in the past we navigated by stars at night so we're really designed to be looking a long long way and in the space of a few decades, we've shrunk our, our panorama, haven't we, from what it should be to whatever it is. What is it, a foot between me and my, my laptop? So, so when I get onto the doorstep, I look out into the distance. And what that has been found to do is it just instantly relaxes you. We find it relaxing. We feel safe. We know where we're going. It just sends messages to our brain that, hey, it's okay. And also, if you think about your eyes as a pair of clenched fists, or a pair of fists, when you're on a screen, your eyes are doing this because they're so focused on that very tight focal gaze, which is quite stressful for our eyes, although we don't feel it. We're putting them under you know, undue stress, really, by spending so much time making them look at such a short distance. So the first thing is to look out into the distance. And whether that's up at the sky or at the treetops or at the roof line, depending on where you're walking, that is the first thing you should do. And then you should really keep doing that as you walk. So keep pushing your vision, your gaze out into the distance. You cite this fascinating study in the UK that found that listeners to natural sounds reported a 30% increase in relaxation. And in terms of natural sounds, birdsong was the runaway winner with 40% saying it made them feel happier. Oh yeah, we love birdsong. We don't have much of it left. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, I, look, that totally makes sense. I'm curious, people tend to walk with their earbuds in. They're mm. listening to, you know, they're probably listening to this podcast right now, which they should, should continue to do. But I'm curious, Absolutely. as you think about, you know, really enjoying the full benefits of walking, d do we benefit from being really engaged, listening to a podcast or music or texting? Like what are some, as you think about ears and how we want to really benefit from walking, how do you view listening to other things other than the natural sounds around you? Well, I'm quite a big fan of listening to podcasts as I walk. I have to be honest. As <laughs> am I, as am yeah. I. But I mean, Also, if you think about it, Jason, it's the, the sort of walk you're doing. There are walks where we might be able to hear lots of birdsong or, you know, the crashing waves, and that's fantastic. But if you're in New York or London, there are a lot of, there's a lot of walking I do where all I can hear is traffic. And on those walks, you know, if I'm walking uh, to an office or a meeting or to the supermarket or whatever it is, there, there is no bird song and there are no crashing waves and there are no waterfalls or anything. So I will then, I would absolutely listen to a podcast, not all the time, but, but quite often. So I'm curious, is there the same benefit if you put on your nature sounds on your headphones while you walk in the city. Can you experience the same benefit? No. No, apparently not. So in some of the studies that's done, they have done exactly that. So people listening to real bird song and then they've, uh, they've given them some natural sounds and it's not the same. It's not the same. And I'm not sure why that is. It could just be, you know, perception. We know it's not the same. It doesn't feel right to be listening to fake <laughs> Big bird song. <laughs> you know, I'm going to bring it back to objections people have. You know, I'll, I'll say one of my favorite Grateful Dead songs, Cold Rain and Snow. So cold rain and snow, big objections to walking, but let's talk about the benefits of each. Yeah. So let's start with, let's start with snow and cold, shall we? So there's been quite a lot of 
quite a lot of research about this recently, yeah, thanks to Wim Hof and his, and his ice bath. So I think we all, or many of us now know about brown fat, but we have these pockets of brown fat. Well, so as babies, we're born with a nice layer of brown fat, which is designed to keep us warm in case, you know, in case a mother decided to run off and leave newborn baby on a, you know, out under a tree. So we're born with this nice layer of brown fat, which is, uh, you know, fantastically healthy. And I'll explain why in a minute. As we get older, we shed our brown fat, but we do keep little pockets of it. So we tend to keep it around the tops of our shoulders and around our collarbones. Those are classic places to keep a bit of brown fat. Now, brown fat sounds, it sounds horrible, doesn't it? (laughs) It's a particularly unpleasant word, really. But brown fat is brilliant. And what scientists have discovered is that brown fat eats up the bad white fat. So white fat is the fat that clogs our arteries gives us harsh attacks and heart disease but brown fat just eats it up so so brown fat is basically it's basically lots and lots of uh, mitochondria so it produces energy and it's uh, one of the ways it produces energy is by eating up the white fat so we all need brown fat now brown fat is triggered by amongst other things cold so if you have a lot of people now are into their cold showers or, or their, their ice baths they do exactly the same thing but if you're out walking on a cold day um, just expose a little bit of your, you know, around your collarbones, around your neck for a little, for a short time to some, which is a very quick way of getting a bit of uh, brown fat sort of built in your, inside your body. But the other way uh, of building brown fat is to take a hot coffee with you. So go for a walk, unwrap your scarf out in the cold and have your hot coffee. And it's a, what a wonderful way to, you know, do something that's very good for your body. And then what about rain? Oh, your rain. Rain. Isn't rain wonderful? It's the, I mean, it, <laughs> any New Yorker should love rain because the first thing that rain does is it cleans away all the pollution. So the air in New York or London or any sort of polluted city with traffic, the air is always much, much cleaner during and after a, a downpour. So that is for a, for a Londoner like me who doesn't want to be breathing in lots and lots and lots of um, PM 2.5, uh, going out immediately after a, a downpour is the best time. But out in the country, rain is really good too. And what rain does is, um, well, it, well, obviously, what, what rain does is it shakes up all the plants and everything, and they too start producing chemicals that we really like. Uh, and of course, it may go back also to that, you know, rain water. We just we need it, so we like it. But it also does give us a much cleaner, a cleaner walk. But I think it's important. I'm glad we're talking about it because it's so easy to to get on board with walking when it's 70 degrees, sunny, pleasant out. Everyone will raise their hand. More difficult when it's rainy, windy, cold, you know, then, you know, maybe not so excited about getting outside and going for a walk. But I think the answer to that is that, well, maybe they don't know the science, but the answer is really to have the right kit, isn't it? It's because we're used to those, we remember those walks, you know, when our parents dragged us out, we didn't, we just got really wet and cold. We were wearing jeans and we were cold for hours. (laughs) So what you need to have is just a set of waterproofs that you have in your backpack or you just have in a pocket or something, you know, little fold up ones, or even one of those, you know, those little plastic cape things. You just need to have something and watertight shoes. And then it's fantastic, isn't it? (laughs) I agree. I agree. So. Something else I thought was interesting and really important to discuss is walking solo. You know, we're obviously in the midst of a loneliness epidemic and you talk about the power of walking solo along with walking with others. So let's start with like the differences between the two and the benefits of those different approaches. We'll start with solo. So solo walking is much, it's much the best way of walking if you want to reflect on something, come up with a a solution to a problem. You know, you're grappling with something, you need a creative solution. So just where you want to be able to mind wander, as you wander, if you like, because of course you can't do that when you're with someone and you're making conversation. But it's also much better if you want to then remember that walk afterwards. So psychologists think this is really just because there are fewer distractions when we walk on our own. But for me, if I'm doing a walk that I want to remember afterwards and I want it really 
uh, sort of clearly etched in my memory, then I will go on my own. And that might be a walk perhaps to think about someone. I lost my dad last year. So quite often I'll, I'll go for a walk and I just want to think about him and try and remember him. And then I want to be able to remember the walk, remembering him, if you like, because I'm slightly worried. You know, we're all worried about forgetting things going from our mind as we get older. So then I would always go on my own. But there are some really interesting reasons for going with other people. One of those is that if you're going on a, a long walk and there are, you know, really steep inclines or it's a very arduous walk, when you're with people that you like, those slopes, those heights appear less high and those distances appear less daunting. So if you're planning a, a, a long trek, it's probably a good idea to go with a bunch of people that you like because the, the trek will be a lot less intimidating being with those people. But also studies have shown that people that walk in a group are much more likely to stick with it. So if you're the sort of person that thinks, oh, I'm just, I would like to be able to walk every day, but I'm just not, you know, I'm not going to be able to do it or I'm not going to be able to stick it out. And you want to have that routine, then to, being in a walking group seems to be very effective. Let's talk about time of day. You, you mentioned morning and then also evening and walking in the morning specifically. There was a study I thought was very interesting. A uh, woman who took a brisk 45 minute walk at 8 a.m. So, okay, that's a serious commitment. The brisk at, four, at 8 a.m., 45 minutes, were more active for the rest of the day and also less responsive to a picture of food. I feel like there's some evil Pavlovian like trick. <laughs> but I was like, wow, that's an interesting study. Yeah, there have been a few studies that that indicate that people who do regular exercise, eat less. So, you know, so some people will say, oh, I'm worried about doing loads of exercise because it's going to make me really hungry. And then I'm, you know, I'm going to eat loads. It, the reverse seems to happen. And what appears to happen is that the more exercised you are, and I'm talking about moderate exercise, obviously, if you're doing, you know, marathons and sprints, you may eat more, you probably will eat more. But if you're just moving throughout your day, again, as we were designed to do, then our appetite seems to sort of moderate itself, if that makes sense. And again, scientists aren't quite sure why this happens, but it may just be that the, our body works out exactly what fuel we need and then is better able to understand when we've had that and, and to say, right, that's enough. It, it's probably just as simple as the whole, our whole system is just working better when we live as we were meant to live, which is uh, moving. <laughs> Not in a lap, not in front of a laptop. Um, does that make sense? But yes, it's interesting, isn't it? It is. It's fascinating. And so if that's the start to your day, I also thought walking in the evening, you talk about walking after eating and the benefits of minimizing blood sugar spike and, and the power of night walks. So let's talk about that. Oh gosh, night walks is my new revelation, really. <laughs> One of the many. Yeah. So night walking is something that I just would never have done. And I think that probably goes for pretty much every female I know. You know, the idea of being out after dark, either in a city or in the country is we just don't feel, we don't feel safe. We don't feel comfortable, but it's, but we need to, because it's actually very good for us. And there are some really, really little simple things. Like, for example, you know, if you're sitting around a table for a long period of time, you just drink more. You, you eat more, you know, you just keep picking at the foods, you top up your glass and, and then you're too full to want to go anywhere. So you roll onto the sofa and turn on, you know, turn on Netflix. So the idea of just thinking, right, we're just going to, we're going to eat, but then we're not, we're going we're gonna to get up from the table and we're just going to go for a sort of an Italian, Italian style evening promenade. So if you go to the Mediterranean, they all walk in the evening. That, that's just what they do. They all go for a walk in the evening in the summer i'm not sure about the winter but really that's something that we could all benefit from and i have found it to be immensely enjoyable because you see the city or the country wherever i am you see a completely different world you know it just everything is everything looks different it smells different it sounds different so you feel as though you've gone and in this age of the pandemic we can't travel it felt to me like i was having a little little holiday by going out in the dark you come home and you sleep well because also the other thing that the darkness has done is the darkness has triggered your production of melatonin. So you come back and instead of having sat in front of bright screens, you come back and your body is saying, right, the melatonin knows you're ready to sleep now. I love it. And 
you know, you, you mentioned COVID and walking and, and, and loneliness. And I think these are still very real things. And I loved that you talk about smiling, the power of smiling when you're walking has health benefits. Yeah. So the study I really liked, I think I mentioned it in the book, the study I really like, it's, it's the one that looks at the cascade effect. So if you, if someone smiles at you, Jason, when you get up in the morning, you go for a walk, someone smiles at you and says, good morning to you. You are many, many, many times more likely then to smile at someone else and say good morning or just smile. And then likewise, they are many, many, many more times likely to pass it on. So you get this sort of chain reaction of smiling going around. And I think we've all had that experience, haven't we, of, of walking out onto the street, you're feeling a bit flat and someone just says, good morning, or even just smiles at you. And it, it's nice, isn't it? It, it, it is. And you know, as I think about loneliness and, you know, look, it's always important to have real deep, meaningful IRL connections, but the power of just smiling to a stranger, you know, I know that I've had days, I've had bad days. I go back years ago where just, you know, that, that smile can just really make a difference when you're kind of down, uh, yeah. complete stranger can, can really help turn your day around. It's powerful. And I think the fact that they are a stranger makes it so much more powerful, doesn't it? Because they didn't need to do that. Right. Uh, whereas, of course, if it was your friend or neighbor, you know, the chances are they would have said hello and smiled. But for a complete stranger to almost go out of their way and take a bit of a risk, because you do take a slight risk, don't you, when you say good morning to a stranger? C certainly in, in London, not, not in small villages or towns, but certainly in London and New York. I mean, I, I, one morning I went out and I said to myself, right, I'm going to say good morning and smile to everyone. And the first person I said, good morning, a smarty, she just completely ignored me. <laughs> she just walked straight past me and I thought, okay. So there is that risk of rejection, isn't there? So it's a, a small thing to do, but it's also a brave thing to do. So I think when someone does it to me, I, I'm really appreciative. I'm curious of all the research you, you did, and, th and there were some great tidbits in the book. What, was there one that stood out to you that was most surprising? Of everything. Yeah. One study. One story like really grabbed your attention. Uh, oh, I think perhaps the studies on trees and what trees do to us, I found uh, mind blowing actually, that you can walk um, in a forest of evergreens and come home and the, eff the effect in terms of how well you sleep is the same as if you were given a sleeping pill. And that's pretty, I mean, that's- wow. That's pretty wow, well, isn't it? Well, okay, we got to stop there. So like, I'm curious, what types of trees, how long was that walk in the trees to get the effect of a sleeping pill? Or do, do we know any of those? Oh, and the other thing, again, with the evergreen trees with the, was that they took Scots, they took the terpenes from Scots pine trees and put them in the Petri dish with a tumor, a breast cancer tumor, and the tumor shrunk away. So they've now found that the terpenes, particularly from certain pine trees, have this sort of anti-cancer effect because what they do is they increase our T cells, which is one of our immunity cells. So, so I mean, that's, that is extraordinary to me. So when I read through those reports, I, I spent the whole time thinking, I must get to an evergreen forest. <laughs> but, but here in London, I couldn't find any. But anyway, I found some in the country. But I think I'm trying to remember how long you need to be out. I mean, in Japan, they're very aware of all this and they do their forest bathing, their Shinrin Yoku, and they will go for a whole day. They'll spend a whole day in a forest. But I think, I can't remember the exact data, but I think it's something like an hour and a half walk in an evergreen forest and you will sleep like a baby. Wow. So in summary, how would you create your perfect walk, which incorporates as many benefits as possible? You know, how would you move your feet? How would you breathe? Would you walk in nature? Would you walk in friends? You know, what time of day duration, if you could just, you know, would it be a beach? Would it be a mountain? Would it be a forest? So if you could just imagine if, if someone had every, you know, resource available and, and all sorts of landscape options, all sorts of times a day, time, times a day, how would you paint a picture of that perfect walk with the greatest number of health benefits? I'd probably say find a river that winds through evergreen trees with a very nice coffee shop in the 
middle. And perhaps a few people along the way, not too many, but just enough, you know, to smile and say hello to. And I'd probably go first thing in the morning when the dawn chorus, you know, the birds are at their peak, which so that would be in sort of April, May time. That's coming up soon, isn't it? April, yeah, so April, May, dawn, forest, river, the coffee shop, <laughs> and a few friendly faces. <laughs> I, I love it. Annabelle, thank you so much. 52 Ways to Walk, one of my favorite books of 2022. Thank you so much.